And Hashem Lechem to Yael and not to Esther and Zahava. And uh, my mother who watches, she's now currently in Europe. Bezad Hashem. She'll get a chance to watch the lesson. I'm going to leave this in here for a while. So I'm dedicating the class to Akiva Moshe ben Reuven and Chasha Shifra Halevi. Allah shalom. It's Nasham Hashem Ali and Ganeidim. So you'll tell me if there's any issues with the, the video or the audio, which I don't expect there to be, but if there is, you'll just send, tell me a message, put a message on the screen. So we're learning from Torah Hay in the Kutim Rowan in part two in Tinyana. And it starts off, we started off last week, Tiku Bechodeshofar Bekesele Yom Chagenu Ki Chok Ni Yisrael Hu Mishpat Le'edoke Yaakov. Because, I'll just read the, the quote from the translation over here. Where are we? Sound the shofar at the moon's renewal, when the moon is covered over on our festive day, for it is statue to Israel, and mishpat unto the Lord of Yaakov. And then he goes on to say, Ha'ikar she'kol ha'torah v'amitzvot hu emunah. The whole purpose, the whole concept behind Torah in mitzvot is emuna. Now, this theme comes up again and again, um, and it actually came up in the Torah that we were learning this morning, me and Rav Cheshen, emuna and malchut. And we've learned a lot about malchut, and I have to say, it's getting clearer and clearer to me, but it's not 100% clear at this point. Let's say ninety-five percent clear. So, what is what does it mean that the whole Torah and all the mitzvot they're coming to teach us emuna? And then he says here, and I'm going to answer my question in just a second. Shehi yesod kol Torah kula that is the foundation of the whole Torah. The tzarich kol achad lechapes et atzmo ulechazek et atzmo beemuna. Everybody has to search within themselves and strengthen themselves in their emuna. So we were talking this morning with Cheshire and I. Okay, sorry about that. By mistake, I, I pressed unfinish. So he says that everybody has to strengthen themselves in their emuna. Lechazek et emuna nishvat lo milamala u lahagdila. And to strengthen the emuna that comes down from above and to increase it. So what does it mean that the purpose of all of the Torah mitzvot is emunah? So, and what is it manchut? How is it connected to manchut? So manchut, we were saying, manchut is the power to choose what you're going to do in this world. So I'll give you an example. Manchut, how does the king um, give an order through speech. That's malchut. So if I were to say to you, unfortunately, nobody's here physically with me, but if somebody were here and I would say, can you please pour me some water? And uh, imagine there's a hand coming from over here and it pours me some water. So that is a person that's listening to my speech and then following the command. So we have the power of speech and we have the power of letters and what do I do with that power? So if I'm using that power for nonsense then I'm taking the power that's in Malchut and I'm using it for something that's not holy. But if I'm using it for example in learning Torah then I'm taking the same power of Malchut, the power of speech, and I'm using it in order to do something holy. And that is basically what he's saying here when he says, Ikar, The whole Torah and the mitzvot are coming to help us to make the choice to be connected to Hashem, which is the essence of Emuna. So show him to, I see Michael Leader. Oh, Hashem. My brother's uh, childhood friend is watching, and Mata Esther figured it out that by mistake I pressed finish, so sorry about that. Okay, so we're learning a lesson about Amuna, and we learned last week that 
there are illnesses, there are afflictions that cannot be healed through medication. And the reason that they can't be healed through medication is because the person has a lack of amuna, a lack of faith. So that's where we got up to last week, and we're going to continue from there. So he was saying that the vegetation has the power to heal, which I mentioned last week, that we know that at least early medication, if not all medication, is founded in some form or another in nature. So for example, when people wanted to make aspirin, they went to native peoples and said, what did you use when people had pains and headaches? And they said, oh, we use this uh, herb over here. And so they went and they extracted whatever it was in the herb that released the, they relieved the pain and they put it into a pill and they sold it. So he's saying that within vegetation, there is the power to heal. And also, of course, the Rambam, who was very specific in saying what you should eat, when you should eat it, and, and saying the power of eating. There used to be a juice stand that I, I went to, I don't even know if they're around anymore, many, many years ago. I went there every morning, I got wheatgrass. I don't think it made any difference for me, and it was disgusting and cost a lot of money. So at some point it stopped. But I was going every morning after shul, I would go and drink my wheatgrass. Ugh, terrible. So there was a, um, a homeopathic doctor, a Russian doctor, who was sending people with recipes of exact amounts of fruits and vegetables that they were supposed to drink in certain combinations as if it was a medical treatment. And so that's what he's saying here. He's saying that every plant and vegetation has its ability to heal. And this is according to the order of how vegetation grows. According to the place where it's grown, the amount of time that it's grown, because there are the types, there are certain types of vegetation where they have the power to heal. But these can only heal if you um, harvest them when they've only grown a third of their size. So if they grow completely, they lose their power to heal. And so if you wait too long, then that vegetation loses its power to heal. And then there's also the types of vegetation that only heal she, um, when it's completely, when it's completely um, ripe and it's fallen off the tree. And similar things like that. And according to the, the order of time that these things need in order for them to reach their um, potency. And it's also dependent on place. This place grows this type of vegetation. And if you're, if you're thinking about this as a parable or as an analogy, then you understand why he's saying this. But only if they grow this in the place where it's the right environment for it to grow, will it heal. But if they grow the same plant in a place where it doesn't have the same ability, it doesn't get the same nutrients from the air, the earth, or whatever it is, you grow it in a place where other types of vegetation are grown. But the only reason that it has the power to heal is because it grows in a certain place in a certain time. So now if we take this little paragraph here, where Rabbi Nachman is talking about vegetation and the power of vegetation to heal, how is that connected to Imuna? And it, I said, if you look at it as a parable, you understand what he's trying to say. He's saying that 
If you were to take your problems that you're having right now and change their location or change their time, change the amount of time, or give those same problems to somebody else, they wouldn't have the power to heal your emuna, your connection with Hashem. And so he's saying, just like we see in nature, that everything needs to grow at a certain time, in a certain place, and for a certain amount of time, and everything has its potency at that time. And if you were to eat a banana, for example, when it's green, it'll give you whatever it does to your body when it's green, different than when it's black and completely turned into sugar and almost rotten. And each of them has different healing elements. And so too, the problems that you're having and the struggles that you're having, they have different elements. And even though a problem might come to you right now, and you would say to Hashem, Hashem, why do you have to cause me this suffering right now? Couldn't you have done it a year ago when I had more energy or I had more money? Couldn't you wait a few years from now? Because I can't deal with it right now. But the reason that Hashem is sending you this particular challenge at this time is because in order for you to have the healing, the fixing that your soul needed when it came into this world, it had to happen in this place, in this time, and for this amount of time. And the order of how vegetation grows. Now we have Seder Zra'im is the order of the Mishnayot. So we have the order of the Mishnayot and also the order that you plant things and the order of how things grow is according to Emunah. The Pchinat Masha Amua Rabbeinu Zichonah was Seder Blessed Memory said Emunah ze Seder Zra'im. Emunah is the order of growing things. Now, you can look at it in just the most simple way. In a second, so let me just find the, the translation here. Emunah is the order of seeds. If you're going to plant anything, you have to have emuna. And you're probably thinking, you, you would probably think that if you're going to plant a winter vegetable in the summer or a summer vegetable in the winter, you'd really have to have a lot of emuna. It's When you plant it in the right time, in the right place, then you need the amuna because what are you doing? You're taking the seed, you're sticking it under the ground, you're covering it up, and you're not going to look at it until hopefully it sprouts out. And every day that you put water on there, and you put whatever nutrients need to be in the soil, and you take care of that seed, hoping that it will grow, that is amuna. Because you have the amuna. Even if you're a person that says, I don't believe, I don't have amuna in anything, if, a per, if you just tell that person, here, take the seed and grow it into a plant, it's a wax on, wax off moment. Whether they knew it or not, they were having a moon, they were having a moon up. So that's why he's bringing it as an example. He says, every time we plant and we reap, it's an aspect of a moon. And according to a moon up, we plant seeds according to place and time. And because we have the amuna that when we plant something, it's going to grow, and we plant it in the right place and at the right time, then when it grows, it has the power to heal. You could take this just literally as an analogy for life. When you are going through whatever challenge you're going through at that time and at that place, and you have a muna that something's going to come out of it, right? If a person is, God forbid, sick, and they, they don't do anything, if they just really just sit there and do nothing, then they probably have no amuna and they're probably severely depressed, and that, that's the first thing that they would have to get out of. But if a person is sick and they say, I want to do something to heal, even if it's just resting, even if it's refraining from eating or eating something different, but all the more so if you're taking medication or going through some type of treatment or surgery, all of that is amuna. A lot of times the problem is that we have amuna in the thing or the person and not remembering that it's a shem that heals us through that thing and through that person. And you can ask yourself, so why doesn't the shem just heal me directly? Why do I have to go to a doctor or take medication to heal? And that's because we live in a halal panui, we live in a, in a vacant space where there's absolute free will of absolute good and absolute evil, 
And in order for that to exist, Hashem can never reveal Himself in such a way where you lose your free will. Because if you did, it would defeat the whole purpose of creation. So Hashem creates the world in a way where He is healing you. But He's healing you through surgery, through, through a doctor, through the healer, through medication, through different treatments, through all kinds of things. In order for you to retain, maintain your free will, absolute free will, and I would say that the, the absolute free will is to be able to say, God did not heal me. That is, the, the, it's the most absurd thing, right? Somebody who has a baby. Science can take an egg and sperm and make a baby from that. They could probably do it in an artificial womb, although I wouldn't want a child that's grown in an artificial room, a womb, but I know that some animals have been grown in artificial wombs. But that doesn't mean that they had the power to create life. Just because science has the ability to take one medication, another medication, put it into your body, and it creates a reaction, doesn't mean that they had the ability to create the reaction. That is a shem. And a, and, but it has to be given over in a hidden way so that you can still doubt it, and you can still say, nah, that was just the medication. That had nothing to do with a shem so that you can have your free will. And it has to be absolutely equal. You have, it, I would say it has to be even harder to say that it's a shem, And it is harder to say that it's a shem, because that's making you take an extra step forward to say, even though I know I'm taking this medication and it's giving me this result, it's not the medication that's doing it, it's a shem. And you can just think, even though we take an egg and we take the sperm and we put them together and all of a sudden the cells start to multiply, and we've created, in, in quote, we've created life. They haven't created life. We just put the electricity together in a world where Hashem created elements and allows us to understand them and mix them together. And the same thing, now we're taking one step backward, another step backward. So we went from the step of life, now going back to the step of healing. And now we're going back to the step of seeing that the struggles that we're having in life are coming from the same exact place. You might think that it's coming from the bank, or it's coming from your employer, or it's coming from your kids or your parents or all kinds of other places, but, and, it, and it is coming from all this. But ultimately it's coming from Hashem in order to help you to grow in your emuna, which is the whole purpose of Torah and mitzvot. And then he says, it has the ability to heal. And that's why if a person is lacking emuna, sometimes they can never be healed. Now, you could find somebody that, that is a complete atheist and has no emuna, and they were sick and they were healed. But I think that he's going to a higher level. I mean, there's all, there's always those facts. Why does the the poor, the the righteous person suffer and the wicked person prosper? Those things will always exist. But in order for us to grow in our muna, we know that when the challenges come our way, it is a, a growth opportunity. The chent fila sheyesh bekocha lerape. And so also, davening, which has the power to heal the sick person, is also connected to emuna. As it's written, regarding Moshe Rabbeinu during the war of Amalek. His, his hands were called emuna, because we know that Moshe, I've uh, got a narrow phone here, so I can't raise my hands up that high, but Moshe had his hands raised the whole time, right, and Yeshua, and I don't know who else, I'm guessing Khaled, were holding up his arms, and at some point they put rocks under his arms. The main thing is that his hands were being held up. But Tao Gumo, and the translation of this is, Prishan Betzelo, Porshot Betfila, that his hands were raised in davening. So you'll see people will go to shul and they'll raise their hands in davening and uh, you know i'd like to raise them really high out here and um 
That's where it's coming from. It's coming from Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe davened, he raised his hand up and davening. Now, you can ask yourself, well, what is that supposed to be? It is an, it is an expression of emuna. It is an expression of faith. You're, you're not holding to yourself. You're releasing yourself. You're opening yourself up in a way for Hashem to come into you. You're making yourself vulnerable by opening yourself up and you're saying, Hashem, I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready to put my faith in you. Um, we know that if you're davening, you're doing it from a place of emuna. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Even I guess even a kid or even a, an adult that just says, well, I guess I might as well daven because nothing else has helped. Even though I don't believe in God, I'll give davening a try. For sure, that's emuna. Where do, you, where do you think that's coming from? If you had no emuna, you wouldn't davening. And all the more so, if you're coming to davening from a place of knowing that Hashem exists and knowing that Hashem can do anything, you are approaching the davening on the basis that you have emuna and that Hashem can change nature. Ki atfila mora adam ma'amin she'akadosh baruchu manhig et ha'olam ki otzono. Because the fact that a person is davening shows that that person believes that Hashem is running the world according to His will. And so the person has faith that their davening can change nature. When a person's faith is completely gone, doesn't help them to daven. Now, I would say that if you really, your faith was really gone, you wouldn't have done it in the first place. I'll give you a personal story here. I've mentioned um, Rabbi Meshi Zahav, who I went to. It's been many years. It was just an experience that I, I'm always drawing from again and again. I told you that he released me from dependency and coming to him at some point. I was going to him something like every six months, every year. I was having a very hard time in life. <laughs> I was struggling financially, and I was having uh, energy problems, and it's just difficult to raise seven little kids at home in a small house with no money. Oh, Hashem, I can't complain about my wife. She's really wonderful. She still is, but really uh, didn't have shalom by the shoes, oh, Hashem. But I was really struggling. A friend of mine said, go to this mikubal. I went, and right away he blew me away, telling me all kinds of things that he couldn't have known, just from the moment I walked in the room. And so when we finally, after he impressed me, um, I finally said to him, okay, look, my problem is I don't have enough money. Whoa. Someone just threw a rock here. <laughs> or something. My problem is I don't have enough money. And he said, Davin. And I said, what do you mean? He said, davening can change nature. He said, if you daven, you can change nature. And that's exactly what Rabbi Nachman is saying here. The davening can change nature. So, Shalom Aleich. So, I went back to him um, several years later, and he he would look at my palm for whatever it was worth, look at my forehead, look at my dugat zuhud, and he would say, ah, things are better. He would know right away, things are better. And, I, and he said, you've been davening, right? And I said, yeah, I've been davening a lot. He said, good, keep davening. And then he did this thing. He said, things are going to get better like this. They're going to be, you know, up and down, up and down, but gradually going, going up. And I would say it's been that way, and I'm still davening. The point being that really you have to understand, and I would say this is the most important thing to get out of the lesson today, that davening can actually change nature. Because nature is not really nature. Nature is Hashem. This world is Hashem. And so when people come to me and uh, share problems with me, like, you know, I will never be able to do whatever. This will never happen for me. So I say to them, for Hashem, anything is possible. You just daven, and you daven as if anything can happen. Because anything can happen. And I'm telling you, anything can happen. You might think there are things that are completely impossible for you. But if you ask Hashem for it and, and, and it's good for you, 
Hashem will give it to you. So, you know, one of the problems is that we ask for very specific things. Say, Hashem, I need one million dollars in my bank account by the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. That Hashem will probably not do for you. But if you say to Hashem, I don't have enough money and I need help. Or I don't have enough help. Sorry, I don't have enough health and I need help. Or I don't have enough of whatever it is and I need help. And you allow Hashem to figure out how that's going to come to you. That's a prayer that can work. And you wonder, well, how long do I have to daven for that? You have to keep davening until either you don't need it anymore because you realize that you never needed it in the first place or until Hashem gives it to you. And sometimes it takes a very long time. And sometimes it comes very quickly. You could daven for something, it could literally come the next day. You can daven for something and it might take many years. The question is, are you willing to continue davening? Are you, are you going to give up? Or are you going to be willing to continue davening? And that willing to continue davening is based on emuna. So that's what we're saying here. The chen z'chut avot an gan ken al emuna. And so, also, the merit of our ancestors is revealed through Amun, Abbechinat HaKadur, as it's written, Benitzavim, Nereh Ba'aretz. Okay, so he's bringing text proofs by saying that um, in the merit of our ancestors, we merit, it comes about through Amun. The first thing he was saying is that if you take medication, he was mentioning herbal medication, it might not help you because of a lack of Amun. He's saying, if you daven, it might not help you because of a lack of muna. And now he's saying, schutavot, in the merit of our ancestors, it might not help you because of a lack of muna. And now he's going into detail here. He's saying that it's, um, how many times? Yep. This is the thing, you know, the Yetzirah is always there. And I, I, I'm not a tzaddik, I'm not on the level that I don't have a Yetzirah. But I, I know the Lubavitcher Rebbe once talked about his Yitzharah. It was quoted in a, a very reliable Chabad newsletter. I once showed it to a friend of mine who's a Shaliach in the States, and he was so, he didn't believe that, he was so shocked, he didn't believe that the Rebbe could have a Yitzharah. Tzadikim, I'm guessing, have a Yitzharah. They just have a, a different Yitzharah than us. They don't have a Yitzharah for necessarily doing um, things that are not, like outright averot. It's more Yetzirah for Gaiva, for maybe pride, um, or for, it could even be pride in doing a mitzvah, you know. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll share with you a funny thing that exactly explains this. So Shabbos morning, I went to the mikveh in Shari Chesed, and the closet that has the towels was locked. And I noticed in the, there's a, like a bin for putting all the used towels. There were hardly any towels there. Now I know where the towels are kept because several years ago, a friend of mine who knows where the towels are kept, he said to me, Hey, Barak, come, let's go refill the towels. They're empty. So we went into this back room and there's a closet where all the towels are kept. So I went to the door for the back room. The door was locked. Now, one time, the front door to the mikvah was locked, so we had to go in through the women's side, and the women's side brings you to behind that door. So, I went in to the women's side, down the stairs, the women go up the stairs. I went down the stairs, behind the door, found the closet, grabbed two big bags of probably a hundred towels each, and schlepped them back out through the women's side, back out through the front door, down the stairs, and put them down on the floor, and opened the bag. And so now, when I first came into the mikvah on Shabbos morning, nobody had towels. And people were either going in the water and just getting dressed wet, or they were using disgusting, old, really dirty towels. From the second that I started to get undressed to get into the mikvah, I see everybody coming in with the towel. And when I'm drying myself up and getting dressed, everybody's got a towel. And I'm thinking, I did that. I brought the towels to the mikvah. And I wanted to come home and I wanted to tell the story to my wife and I said, no. Now, I'm, the only reason I'm telling you in the class is to give the example of the Yetzirah of a tzaddik, which, of course, I'm not a tzaddik. Um, I wanted to tell my wife, but I said, if I tell my wife, it would be gaifa, it would be pride. 
I wanted to tell the rabbi in shul. I said, if I tell him, it comes from a place of pride. Finally, I just shut my mouth. I, I actually completely forgot about it. But this is an example of where the pride of a tzaddik would come in. And the tzaddik could say, look, a, a rabbi could say, look at how many chassidim I have. If you take the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you could say, look at how much I've done in this world. And from that, they can have a Yetzirah that comes and attacks them. And now this is an answer to Zahava's uh, statement, that you want to give up. Sometimes you want to give up. That's because the Yetzirah is always there, nagging everyone, trying to bring you down. And we've talked a lot about the Yetzirah. What is the goal of the Yetzirah? He's not going to come... And like, you're walking down the street and just knock you down. The Yetzirah waits until you fall yourself. Then he starts to bring you down and down and down and down. You know, imagine a person was on a diet. And they said, ah, I broke my diet today. So screw it, I'll just eat everything I wasn't ever supposed to eat. And then it, you just feel worse and worse and worse. You wake up the next day, you say, well, I'm such a loser. Look at me, I couldn't keep my diet. I screwed everything up. What do I need this stupid diet for? And you go off the diet completely. So I'm not recommending diets for anyone. I'm saying that that's how the Yetzirah works. You do something, you find a little thread, and you pull on it, and then the Yetzirah comes and pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls. At some point, you're going to realize that it's the Yetzirah. And you can say out loud, this is the Yetzirah. I know the Yetzirah is trying to bring me down. And the way to get through it is to simply push forward. Now, if you can go one step forward, you can sing a song. And if you can go another step forward, you can even dance. And if you really realize that you're being challenged by the Yetzirah, and you have the ability to overcome the Yetzirah, you can dance for joy that you're being challenged and you're getting over the challenge. I had this on Hanukkah. This year, I think it was the fifth night of Hanukkah. I don't remember what it was. We weren't playing outside because of the rain. And whatever was going on in my life at the time, I don't even remember. Probably we had run out of money again, which is normally what happens. And I was really depressed and I didn't want to go outside and play music. And it started to rain and this and that. And in the end, I just grabbed the guitar, I grabbed the chair, and I started heading out and I got stuck in the door and I ended up breaking a window and it like popped and the glass went all over the place and my youngest son, Levi Yitzhak, he said, ooh, like in the movies. And I ended up having to fix the window and I, and I knew this is all the Yetzirah coming to push back against me wanting to go out and play music and find the Chanukiah on Chanukah. That's how the Yetzirah works. So one of the things that Rabbi Nachman says is, Constantly be vigilant in your joy. That's why he say that's why he says mitzvah gedola liot b'simchat tamid. Now, of course, you can't walk around with a smile all the time and be happy all the time. That doesn't make any sense. It's not natural. You're either on drugs or you have something wrong with you. But what he, what he means is mitzvah gedola liot b'simchat tamid is that you're always catching yourself. Try to be b'simcha. Try to strengthen yourself b'simcha. When you're finding yourself falling from the level of being basimcha, try to lift yourself up. And you're seeing the same thing in this lesson here. You're seeing emuna. When you feel the lack of emuna, strengthen yourself in emuna. And when you feel strong in emuna, hold on to that emuna. It's something that you have to work on all the time. It's not something that you do once and it lasts for the rest of your life. It's not like chicken pox where you get it, and then you're immune for the rest of your life. Bezat Hashem. This is something that requires daily, regular, vigilant work to push the Yetzirah aside and say, thank you very much. I'm going to focus on the good. Now, for those people who've been watching these lessons for years, you've heard all of this. You know, focus on the good points and strengthen your Amuna and strengthen your Simcha. You have to just work on it again and again and again. There's a guy, Noach, uh, I don't remember his last name. He's a, he just got his smicha. He, he announced it on Facebook, meaning he got his rabbinical certification in Kashrut. And I remember when he showed up at Simchat Shlomo, at Shalom's Yeshiva, 
the guy he could, couldn't even say the letter chet, because he would say het. He couldn't even pronounce the words properly. I think it took him eight years, ten years of learning, thousands and thousands of hours and working and never giving up, and he got his smich. And that's the vigilance that you need. To you fall down, you get up. You fall down, you get up. There will be times when you just have to lay on the ground and say, right now, Hashem, I can't get up. But don't let yourself stay there for too long. The moment that you have the slightest bit of energy, get yourself up. Because that's the whole point. Okay, so I'm looking at the time. I have a really good story, and I want to finish this section. So we're talking about, he's explaining all the different things that normally you would use them to heal yourself, and they don't work. We had the the herbs, we had um, davening, we have schuta vot, the merit of our ancestors, and we also have um, shouting out. So we're going to learn this last section here. I'll tell the story, and then we're going to be finished for tonight. Vegam ein mo'ila chole kol tsa'aka shel ach o genichot. And it also doesn't help the person who's sick to shout out with ach or ach, ach. Oh, oh, you know, like it's painful. Um, sighs and releasing and shouting. It's not going to help the person. Sometimes it helps a person when they shout from pain. That in heaven, Hashem says, I'm going to have compassion on this person for shouting out from pain. Even though he doesn't have any merit to be healed from his illness, nonetheless, even though the person doesn't have any merit for being healed, just the shouting and crying and the the guttural. Ah, and ah, those sounds coming from a deep place, that's enough for heaven, for Hashem, to have compassion on a person. Afilu ein lo shum tzchut, even though the person has no merit, aval al yedei nifilat ha'amuna, gam zein mo'yin, but when a person is completely lacking of amuna, that won't help them either. Ki ha'genichot ve'atzakat ach hanal, because when we say these things, or these, these shouting out, it's speaking, but it's not forming any words. The korns of chinat, avahan, which is a vote, the voice is a vote, the, our forefathers, our ancestors, ki akorn kalul me'esh that's a little section that I, I skipped over here, so he's saying, what do we get from our ancestors? We get all of these refined attributes. But these attributes, chesed, gevua, tiferet, these only come about through having a muna, having faith in our ancestors. Um, let's see. He's now going into detail here. He's saying, what each thing does. The gam ze, gam al yidei ze, ba'atzmo, she'ino yechol lekabel et ha'shefa shel ha'sfirot chesed gbu'a tiferet mechimat she'en lo kli shel emuna. So let's say, even if these, in the merit of our ancestors, that we find these attributes, we're receiving them through, I don't know what you would say, time, um, osmosis, in a sense, you know, because we are the descendants of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, through them, and of course the, the Imahot, through them we're receiving chesed, vua, and tiferet, compassion, stringency, and the, in the synthesis of the two of them, that's what tiferet is. So chesed is when a person is showing kindness, gvua is severity, I guess you could say chesed is when you say yes 
Gevura is when you say no, and Tiferet is when sometimes you say yes and sometimes you say no. The ability to have these attributes come as a result of our ancestors. But you have to have a vessel in order to receive those attributes, and the vessel is emuna, is faith in Hashem. Ein mo'ilo efo'ah shel asavim, so it won't help the person to take medication or herbal treatments. Ki ikar ha-refo'ah hi alidei ha-mazgot, it mazgut ha-yesodot. Because you have to bring all of these things together, Eish, Mayim, Ruach, Hafar, Betzarich, Vezei, Chacham Gadon. You have to have somebody who's a, an expert that knows how to bring together fire, water, wind, and earth, all of the additional attributes. Sheyada Am Pi Ha Dokter, I think that's what it says, Dokterai. Chokhmat refu'ah through the the medical expert to bring these things together in order to heal the person. Now he's going to say at the end, but the only way that any of this healing can actually work is if a person has emuna. Bi'am kain al yedei pkam be'emuna, and so if a person is lacking in emuna, al yedei ze nifkam pchinat arba yisodot ki kulam mitkalim rak al yedei pchinat afar. He's saying that all of the, the foundations, all of these elements are going to be affected because the person is lacking a muna. A muna is the vessel to receive them, and that's where we're going to stop for now. So we're now on section bet of this lesson. Okay, I'm going to tell a short story about um, Lagba Omer, which if I had remembered that it was Lagba Omer, Lagba Omer is coming up next week, I would have recorded this for the podcast. But as my life goes, I can barely squeeze in all of the things that I try to do. And I'm not recording another story for this week, so it'll be for next year. But we'll see if, if you remember the story next year if you listen to the podcast. Okay, it's a great story. When did I get this? This is from 2021, so two years ago. There was a group of um, young, I'm guessing they were Haredi men, that were in Meron, or from Ashtod, on Lagba Omer, and they were in Meron, and they were dancing, and somebody mentioned that there's a segula, so there's a mer, a segula is an auspicious, it says here, auspicious moment, omen, but a segula is an enabler, just like you have a catalyst in chemistry, a segula means that if you do a certain thing, it enables a certain type of bracha to come down. So there's a segula that if a person on Nagba Omer, especially if they go to the grave and they want the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, um, and they make a pledge. So here the pledge is that they, they, would, they would bring 18 roitel, which is 54 liters of wine. Um, these, they said that they, they were bringing, okay, so I'm sorry, I mix up the story a little bit. So these guys were rejoicing in Lagba Omer, and they brought all this wine, and somebody said to them, what's the wine for? And they said, last year, there was a couple that had been married for many years. They didn't have any children. We decided that we're coming, and we're davening for them in Meron, and we're going to donate these 54 liters of wine. And they gave birth this year, so we're very excited for our davening. So somebody heard, it, heard about this, and he said he has a friend who'd been married for six years and they never had any children. And so he makes an oath. And it, here it says, and this is took place in 1997. He made an oath that um, he would bring 54 liters of grape juice the next year if his friend, or in the marriage of that, his friend and his wife should have a child. And so everybody's saying the Chaim and Mazel Tov, and a month before Lagba Omer, the next year, they had, the, the couple had a boy. And there was somebody else who had made um, an oath that year, and they also had a child. So they got to the point where they were going to bring 108 liters of grape juice and wine to Meron on Lagba Omer the next year. And this wasn't an easy thing to do. So they knew that there was some chesed organization 
that would take it a fee, but they would take the responsibility of delivering a segula food to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai on Lagba Omer. So I just love the idea, first of all, that there's some organization in Bnei Brak where they said, you know what, anybody who needs to deliver this wine from making an oath on Lagba Omer, since delivering 108 liters of of wine and grape juice is not so easy, we're going to take that on ourselves and we're going to charge a little fee, but just a minimal fee to deliver and we're going to make sure it gets delivered. So these guys said, okay, we have to deliver 108 liters of wine and grape juice. We're going to give it to this organization. They go, they put the deposit, they give the money. And a few days before Lagba Omer, they're asking, was their stuff delivered? And every time, for some reason, the driver left the stuff behind. They kept saying, you know, how can it be? And this is a reliable organization. And they would call and say, did you deliver the grape juice and the wine? They, they looked in the warehouse and it's sitting there. So they understood that something was going on. And they decided that they were going to bring the cases themselves. They would go to Bnei Brak, they'd pick them up. So now these guys live in Ashtot. They brought them back to Ashtot. And they figured they're going to put it on the bus to Meron underneath. And they'll schlep it. Up the hill, they'll figure it out when they get there. So they're waiting at the bus stop with 108 liters of wine and grape juice, and the bus passes them by. And they realize that something is going on here. So they, all these obstacles were in the way. They, they made an oath. The couples gave birth. They want to bring the wine and grape juice the organization doesn't deliver it, the bus passes them by, and then out of nowhere, there's a Sherut, a group taxi, that shows up going to Meron. And the driver called out, Ashdod, and the, he was coming from Ashdod and going to Meron, and these guys thought to themselves, how could there be a driver that's coming from Ashdod exactly when we need it? And so, he said, they said to the driver, what are you doing here? And he said, well, it just worked out that this is where I was at this time and I need to get to Meron and I'm trying to pick up people. So they decided to hire the whole taxi for themselves because they figured this is it. No more obstacles. They load up all the wine. They start heading up to um, Meron and as they're driving, the driver tells them how much it's going to cost. And it was like, I don't know, something like a thousand shekels. And they said, what are you talking about a thousand shekels? It's crazy. And he said, listen, first of all, you took the whole taxi. And second, you've got 108 liters of wine and grape juice, and that costs more money. So they explained to him that they're bringing this because they went to Dalvin for friends, the friends gave birth, and they're fulfilling an oath. So this driver, he looks at these Haredi guys these young Haredi guys, and he says to them, listen, my sister has been married for 12 years, and she hasn't had any children. I'm going to deliver this wine for free, on the condition that you go to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and you daven for my sister. And if she gives birth, I'm going to bring 54 liters of wine next year for my sister. And so they got to Meron, and they delivered the, the grape juice and the wine, and they parted ways, and they didn't take each other's numbers, or didn't have any way to stay in touch with one another. And then, the next year, they were in Bnei Brak, and they hired um, a driver to take them to Meron, and the driver was in a brand new car, a new van, and the battery died. The driver said it didn't make any sense, they went over to a taxi stand, and there was a van there, and on their way, the driver in the van says, just this morning at 3 a.m., his sister gave birth after 13 years of marriage. And these Haredi guys, they're looking at the driver, and they're wondering if this is the driver that drove them last year, that, made, that asked them to daven for him. And they start talking with one another, and they realize that it's the same driver. And they're sitting there speechless because the driver the previous year had asked them to daven for his sister. And the driver said, now I'm driving to Meron with my 54 liters of wine in order to thank Hashem 
for the blessings that he gave us. And this is a guy who had been secular up until then, when he realized all the Ashkacha Pratit, that he ended up being the driver for these guys, that they davened for him, that his sister gave birth. And then by complete Ashkacha Pratit, he ended up being their driver all over again the next year, taking them to Maron with his 54 leaders. He said, that's it. I haven't been keeping Shabbos, but I'm going to start keeping Shabbos now. So that is the power of davening at the grave of Tzadikim, which we talked about in the last lesson. We were talking about how you go to the grave of a Tzadik and you daven and you do, you do, we do it varim. So in the merit of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, I hope everybody finds a bonfire to go and dance. I know here in the neighborhood, I'm pointing over here, in the Knesset neighborhood, not the Knesset, the, the government, the neighborhood is called Knesset. They have a big bonfire here in Nachlod in general. Sorry. You'll find bonfires in the street. Go dance a little bit and dab into Hashem and ask for everything that you need. There's that Hashem by next year. You're bringing 54 liters of wine and grape juice to thank Hashem for all the blessings that came your way. And also for watching the lesson, Shukoch, everyone should be blessed just in the merit of watching the lesson. And I should be blessed back with Zat Hashem. So we'll meet again next Tuesday night. Hashem to everyone. Thank you for joining us.